Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. Today we have a manga review of chapter 920, I Love Odin. And this week we have quite a rich chapter actually, giving a 101-esque summary of the events that have led to the situation we have on Wano today. And there's no room for interpretation anymore, this is a legit time travel. As in plucking what looks to be five individuals from one time and plonking them in another. But while it felt like quite an information dump while reading the chapter, there are still so many holes and questions that indicate a proper full-scale flashback is certainly on its way. First and foremost, the figure of Toki is just far too intriguing to leave it at something like this. In this chapter, she said that she had been traveling into the future using a Toki Toki ability, which is more than likely indicating that it is a devil fruit given the name structure. And for those of you who don't know, Toki is actually the Japanese word for time, well, depending on how it's written. And you know it's not confirmed if it is a devil fruit, but I'd be pretty shocked if it wasn't. And just getting slightly off topic, but if Lady Toki is dead, that means that that devil fruit has been released back into the world. And I think that means that we are definitely going to see a resurgence of the Shanks time manipulation devil fruit theory. And just briefly on that, there's been a lot of speculation on whether or not Shanks can manipulate time, it essentially stems from how he just appeared at Marineford at the perfect time without being noticed until the conflict with Akainu. And what we do know of the time ability from this chapter lines up kind of perfectly with that theory, particularly the part about only being able to travel into the future. But that is a huge topic and one I don't really want to waste this whole video on. So back to Wano. After the end of the last chapter, I'd assumed that there were nine time travelers due to the whole Nine Shadows prophecy thing, but it turns out it's just Kinemon Kondra, Raizo, Momonosuke, and Kiku, which is odd for a couple of reasons. Firstly, there was a fifth samurai, or retainer, whatever they call them, wearing an Amigasa, who we saw in front of the burning castle and bowing to Toki. Oh, and just quickly on the burning castle, this is a super small thing, but I really liked that Kinemon's ability to cut fire was referenced once more, which is clearly how they were able to get into the building in the first place. But back to the mystery figure, this dude, or dudette I guess, did not travel through time with the rest of the group, for some reason. My best guess is that it has something to do with Kozuki Hiori, the younger sister of Momonosuke. I find it really odd that Toki would only entrust Momonosuke to the retainers rather than, you know, save the lives of both of her children. Sadly, this does put an end to my Tama is Momonosuke sister theory, but there's a fun possibility of Hiyori still being out there in the world right now and being much older than Momonosuke. But yeah, there must be more to this whole plan in regards to those two missing figures. However, this does open up probably the first reasonable explanation as to who exactly visited Crocus that one time way back on the cover of chapter 631. The figure during this chapter wears an identical Amigasa, but that shouldn't be taken as any sort of proof because I also noticed that Inu Arashi wears the same style of Amigasa Gasa during this chapter, in fact. What we can infer is that Crocus's visitor is either from Wano or has visited the country, and to be honest, it just makes sense that it would be this fifth mysterious retainer who may have left Wano with Hiyori. The question becomes why is he visiting Crocus? And that would be fairly simple. Kozuki Odin was known to travel with Roger, Crocus was a member of the Roger Pirates, and thus a retainer of the Kozuki clan would have more than likely met him in the same way that Momonosuke has met Roger himself. But this chapter brings up a whole ton of potential regarding Toki herself. The idea that she comes from a faraway past and has been consistently traveling forward in time is just fascinating because it's entirely possible that Toki lived during the void century or even beforehand. That alone makes me absurdly excited for the eventual proper Wano flashback, but we also have Odin to throw into the mix. And I don't really know what I was expecting, but I do really enjoy what we've seen of his character so far. I very much like the idea of a delinquent son of a shogun, which by the way, I'm very thankful that we now know how Odin is connected to the ruling structure of Wano. There's been a lot of confusion regarding him being the prior shogun, which he wasn't. He was but a simple daimyo, but he was the direct spawn of a shogun, which means that Momonosuke now does have a legitimate claim to the title, which was kind of vague before, to be honest. But I'm currently mentally preparing myself for Odin to turn out to be a completely goofy character because he's been built up to be such a badass. And knowing One Piece, that's in order for Oda to be able to subvert our expectations. Within that flashback, we also have quite the panel showing Kaido and what I'm presuming are the three calamities the latter of whom are in the classic One Piece silhouette. We can make out Jack pretty obviously, but there's also a silhouette that looks annoyingly like Pika. It's not Pika, please just stop with those thoughts right now. And the third silhouette is a pretty unremarkable looking bald dude with a mustache and a triangular smile. If I had to guess, I'd say that the Pika looking one is king and the bald dude is queen, but that's entirely based on the prominence that they were given in the panel. Jack is definitely the smallest silhouette pictured there, which is terrifying because he's already such a presence on his own. So those other two calamities must be incredible monsters to outrank him. And just on Kaido, this chapter ended with the beginnings of the plan for his downfall, which will commence in 
and apparently two weeks time on Onigashima, which looks to be a completely separate island actually. It's quite possibly this is the winter island we've seen often come up in association with Kaido, particularly with the mysterious horns that tend to accompany it. So there's some pretty crazy news there. Firstly, because if Onigashima is indeed a different island, then Wano is more of a stepping stone into another arc potentially. At the same time, there just seems to be so much business to take care of here on Wano that I would be pretty surprised if attention was diverted elsewhere, especially since we had the chapter title previously of a great adventure on the land of samurai. I doubt we'd have that if we were moving on, and my gut feeling is that this all comes back to Wano, even if Onigashima is a different island. I mean, who knows, all of this discussion could be completely irrelevant if it ends up being part of Wano. The next thing about the plan though is that we have a wonderful One Piece time frame established of two weeks. So anybody who thought that the Reverie was going to come back into focus, I think this is the final nail in that coffin. The Reverie is only a seven day conference, so it will be long done by the time this arc has concluded, and I suspect we'll just see the aftermath of it. Of course, the most genius thing is that we're currently operating on an isolated island. Wano doesn't receive any news or have any idea of what's going on in the outside world, so it gives Oda license to just not worry about the logistics of world changing events at the moment and focus purely on this part of the story. With all of this, I should say that any plan proposed in One Piece has never gone smoothly, so this will no doubt be thrown into complete chaos. But I still think it's going to take a decent chunk of in-world time to complete. This two-week business from Kinemon is the second time flag we've had during this arc, with the first one coming from Hawkins, who openly stated, the chances of Luffy and Zoro being alive one month from now. So to me, it still looks like we are strapping in for the long haul here. Other than that, there are a couple of small things I wanted to mention. Zoro wandering off alone was weird. I mean, yeah, it's perfectly within character, and it's obviously for some kind of important plot element, but it just feels really clunkily done at the moment. And you know what, actually, who knows, maybe he'll end up catching a ride to Onigashima and defeating Kaido himself. I also have what is probably the smallest nitpick in the world, but it bothers me, so you're going to hear about it as well. There's a page where everyone is listening to the story of Odin. It's the one where you see the silhouette of him fighting against Azura Dolji, who seems to be very specifically name dropped and almost guaranteed to appear again in the future as a result, but that's not my issue. My problem is the top left hand panel of Nami listening to the story. It just really, really bothers me that half of the panel is negative space and Nami's head is just sort of squashed into the bottom half. I really think that it should have had something in the background to balance it, or that Nami's head should have just taken up at least three quarters of the panel and maybe rearrange the text bubbles to accommodate. But yeah, it just shits me because the panel is artistically unbalanced and not at all like the typical highly detailed work of Oda. And you know what? It probably doesn't bother anyone else. So hey, let's have some more positives. I really enjoyed going through the events of the new world in reverse by following the samurai departing from Wano, seeing them end up on Zoe, then dress Rosa, and finally Punk Hazard. It was such a cool little journey that really tied up pretty much every arc in the new world thus far. I mean, except for Fishman Island and Whole Cake Island who are on their own story thread, but it really reminded me that these characters from Wano have been with us for an awfully long time now. It's the closest thing we have to another Vivi really, where we went through three arcs with her for if you want to count Reverse Mountain, before we got to the meat of her story. And as a result, the conclusion of Alabasta felt like it was really earned. So I'm hoping we get a similar, if not greater feeling by the end of Wano. And that pretty much does it for chapter 920. If you enjoyed this video, then feel free to like, favorite, or subscribe. And if you are in any way inclined to help support this poor independent channel, then also feel free to check out my Patreon, Discord server, or Twitter, the links to which are in the handy description below. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on the chapter. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time.